I don't think it's our job to help these people. You okay? Treat people like this! Count time. To uh, hell, you've been good at making money, Roger. I know it's hard up here, but you don't, you don't. I just reached my breaking point around 15 seconds into Fallout Episode 4, The Ghouls. This upbeat 1940s, 1950s Americana musical nonsense is too goddamned much already. Its ebullience felt more suffocating than stimulating, even when I dug up the words to the opening song, a cheesy tune about how life's worth living when nature's giving, and discovered that the computer game Fallout 3 took it from a 1950s nudist film. Any civilization that has spent two centuries immersed in this kind of kitsch is fortunate if its biggest concerns are radioactive bears and noseless undead. I don't think the ghoul is a perfect villain. His shock value tough man language and his entire, I'm you, sweetie, you just give it a little time, thing bother me so much that I think it's time to stop calling this garbage, video game dialogue. What type of lesson he's attempting to teach me is unclear to me. I understood that he wasn't attempting to impart any lessons to Lucy at that moment, when he was coolly and systematically chopping off Lucy's finger in retaliation for chewing off one of his own. You want to think that he's trying to make her more resilient and shake her innocence, but the way he dribbles his water in front of her, gloats while she downs radioactive animal poop or whatever the hell it is, chops off her finger and then sells her to organ harvesters, who probably won't see her again, makes that impossible to reconcile. He is simply acting cruel because that is who he is. Just before he blows the head off a bad guy in a movie, he describes himself as a villain in an old Mexican eulogy about how a person was ugly, strong, and he had dignity. This is his old, completely human self. Cooper gives the villain a two out of three before stabbing him in the head. However, the ghoul is now only powerful and ugly. His heinous violence to Lucy proves that his dignity has long since vanished. Despite being forced to complete a type of minigame where she must escape the movie hostel, Lucy chooses not to repay it. He trades Lucy into an organ harvesting operation in order to obtain his treasured life-preserving vials, which are the only thing preventing him from becoming insane and savage like the unfortunate guy he murders in the open. The group, which is housed in an abandoned Megamart, is made up of two slackers and a happy-go-lucky robot named Snip Snip, who is voiced by Matt Berry. The man has an English accent that borders on Michael York or James Mason. It's a darkly humorous scenario where poor hostage Lucy's situation just gets worse. The menace of vivisection has taken the place of the threat of sex slavery. Ghouls and humans imprisoned in small cages. Freezes brimming with severed limbs. Draws stuffed with amputated digits. Men who want live organ donation while keeping their eyes fixed on the breast tube. Lucy manages to get away. But not because of herself, she didn't realize that the organ traffickers she was ordering to be released were actually wild ghouls. She hasn't given in to the ghouls' brutal interpretation of America, despite being born again and outfitted for life in the wasteland. That is, on a personal level, she continues to be well known in a community made up only of the offspring of those who were wealthy enough to escape the destruction caused by nuclear war and leave everyone else on their own. Despite this, she doesn't murder the ghoul or let him perish. She gives him several vials, which enable him to resurrect and plunder the whole cache, most likely providing him with sustenance for years to come. Just like she has been saying, Lucy embodies the golden rule. Finally, Fallout has an impressively filthy mind. The moment Lucy finally gives in to her own helplessness and drinks radioactive water reminds me of a very similar, and very similarly kink-shaded, scene in which the magic-wielding prisoner Egwene gives in and pours water on behalf of her slave driver. Perhaps this is just because actor Zelia Mendez Jones appears in both shows. All I can say is that I'm not made of stone, even though you might not have felt the same way about Ella Purnell drinking water from a trough as a towering, cadaverous Walton Goggins watches on and holds her leash. The same is true at the vault, where efforts are underway to civilize the raiders who have been arrested while a competition is underway to replace Hank as overseer. Following a lead from an apprehended raider, Norm and his cousin Chet explore the destroyed Vault 32 and learn that its occupants committed mass murder-suicide more than two years before to the raider's arrival. 
The only indication they have is bloody graffiti that reads, we know the truth, and death to management. All of the papers pertaining to that vault and its communication with their own have been sealed, and the raiders were able to access the vault door by using a code that belonged to. Mother of Norm and Lucy, long lost. Chet embarks on this adventure, however, in order to escape the scene at his house, where Steph, the homicidal pregnant lady with one eye, is giving birth. Why that particular place? Because she offered her late husband's belongings, dressed Chet up in them, jumped his bones, and had her water break nearly instantly when his fingers touched her bathing suit region, all in an attempt to coerce Chet into acting against the raiders. Well, I guess any direct mention of wetness as a sign of pleasure shows a willingness to be honest in the representation of sex, which is admirable, even though in this instance Chet was a little wrong. This episode is a little off-model in that it doesn't contain any Maximus content. Fallout seems to have a winning combination of brutal violence, entertaining creatures, great gags, and a dirty mind, though I may be sounding like a broken record. Even with writer Kieran Fitzgerald and director Daniel Gray Longino replacing the original trio of Jonathan Nolan, Geneva robertson Dwarit, and Graham Wagner, it is still the case. Every episode seems like the first one of a new series. <laughs>